3, 17 through 18. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need things. But you do not realize that you are wretched, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and save, sa sa save, the salve, to put on your eyes so you can see. Have you seen the light? Is there a peace inside that makes you testify? Do you sing it with all your might, with all your heart? Because that's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 12, which we've been in for a while now. And we're going to get into a little bit more. Actually, we're going to get to the end of this chapter, but we're still not quite through with it. Because then we get to that time of the true believers in John chapter 13 where Jesus spends that intimate time with him, giving him his final instructions. But let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for the love that we have from the Father through the Son. We thank you for your spirit that resides inside each and every believer and ties us together, unifies us. Us with so many differences and everything is being brought together to be like Christ, to bring glory and honor to you. May we hear your words today and apply them to our hearts. May we make a difference in this world, bringing glory and honor to you. For you will bring glory and honor to your name. You always have, you always will. And we just thank you that you are sovereign and reign supreme. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I entitled this, Safe and Secure. And Debbie said that brought to her thought a song. I think it's number 354 in your hymnals. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Anthony Showalter wrote this song as an answer to letters that he had received some of, from his former students. They had experienced the loss of a spouse in their life and had asked him how to deal with it and so forth. And Showalter penned the words, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. It's from Deuteronomy 33, 27, which reads, The eternal God is our refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemies before you, before you, saying, destroy them. You see, if you're a child of God, if you know Jesus Christ and you know the Father, you have the Spirit where you can cry out, Abba, Father, you have nothing to fear. You have everything to rejoice about so that you can testify to His love. So that you can bring Him glory and honor. Leaning on the everlasting arms would be the chorus for this new song, but he had no verses. He wrote a friend, Elisha Hoffman, and Hoffman wrote back the words that we ha now have the verses for the songs. So my question for you today is, are you safe and secure from all alarms? That's what Jesus is saying in John chapter 12. Remember, the Greeks have come and abandoned the wisdom of the world to see this Jesus because they've heard that He was the Messiah, that this was the true way, the true life. Jesus had come into Jerusalem as the King, as the promised Messiah. Hosanna, save us! But yet, many doubted. But yet, some believed. But they were afraid to proclaim it. They were afraid to testify. They were afraid to rise up for fear of what men would do for them, or do to them. So were they really saved? Did they really believe? Can you have that safe and secure feeling if you're ashamed of Jesus Christ? I can give you verses that might contradict that. Maybe you can think of them right off. If you go back in your hymnal, look in your hymnal on page 345 and see what song that is. It's another familiar song. 
And if it rings a bell, you might know that I have mentioned this song before. A lady named Fanny Crosby wrote it. She was, bl was made blind by a quack daughter, a doctor, not daughter, very early in her life. Then her father died. Her mother had to go find work and had to leave the raising of Fanny to her grandmother, who was her spiritual light. So she wrote this hymn called, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Because that's the only way you're going to be safe and secure is if you put all of your doubts and fears and all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Not just say, I believe, therefore I'm saved, and I can live however I want to live. Jesus is clear. If anyone would come after Him, He must deny Himself, take up His cross, take up the call and mission of Jesus to continue to shine their light. Jesus has said in John chapter 12 that anyone who is illuminated will become a child of light if in fact you've been illuminated. If you're safe and secure, if Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Wow, because He's gone to prepare a place for you. He sits at the right hand of the Father saying, He, she belongs to me. They have accepted me as Savior and Lord. So is this your story? Is this your song? Is it praising your Savior all the day long? Beautiful words penned from Scripture from the fact that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can do it now. You will do it one day. The choice is yours. So how about another song? If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. Clap your hands. If you're saved and you know it, stomp your feet, right? If you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely show it. Is that true of you? Are you safe and secure leaning on the everlasting arms? Because God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. If you would believe in Him, you would not perish, but instead have everlasting life. I hope those words echo throughout your mind so that it'll change your heart so that it'll change the way you live because God only had one son and he sent him to be an atoning sacrifice for each and every one of you that you would call him Savior and Lord you would thank God for what he did through Jesus Christ and then he doesn't abandon you or orphan you he sends himself to abide in you to make you a royal priesthood a holy temple gathered together in this church age to bring glory and honor to him but now is the time for judgment this is the end of Jesus's public ministry the last time he would talk openly to the people and say if you will believe in me, if you will come after me. So we're at John chapter 12, verse 44. Then Jesus cried out, passionately pleading, this is your last chance. I've already hid the light from you so you see what's coming. Are you going to believe in me while you have the light so that you can walk as children of light? Verse 44, Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me, does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words, but, remember us talking about that but, does not keep them, does not apply them, does not live by them, I don't judge that person. It's okay, right? We can be saved and know it and not let our light surely show it, right? No, I don't think that's what it's saying. Let's go on. I don't judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Another outstanding but. That's why Jesus came. Verse 48. There is a judge, though. Don't forget that. That God of the Old Testament. Ooh. 
that sometimes we don't even want to think is the God of the New Testament because we're under grace now. But see, God is still the judge. He's still sovereign. He still will not tolerate sin. Thank goodness, because we'll live in a place where there is no more sin. There are no more tears. There are no more death. Because He will make everything right. And He has to judge sin. And the only way to be pardoned is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The one God sent to take your place. Verse 48, there is a judge for the one who does what? Rejects me and, there's that again, does not accept my words, my teachings, my commands, the ones that lead to eternal life. There is a judge, don't forget that. I'm not coming to judge, I came to save. But there will be a day, there will be a judge. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all have sinned. The wage is what you deserve for sinning against God, and we forget who God is, is eternal separation and death from God. The very words I have spoken, all of Jesus' public ministry, the very words I have spoken will condemn them at that last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all I have spoken. Jesus, who was God, did not consider equality with God as something to use to His advantage, but instead laid down His life to save you. God Himself, and we make excuses for why we put, don't put Jesus as Lord of our life, because we're afraid of what it might cost us. Jesus is clear about we should calculate our cost and consider the worth. That if we suffer all throughout this world and never have anything, it doesn't even compare to the riches that we'll have in heaven. The Father who sent me commanded me to say all I have spoken. I know... I am God's Son. I have His authority. I have been sent. My words are true. That His command leads to what? Eternal life. No doubts, no insecurities. You can have those promises. That if the whole world is against you, it doesn't matter if Jesus is for you, if you put your faith and trust in Him. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Nothing more, nothing less. And at this point, Jesus goes off to be with those who believe, who put their faith and trust in them. Do they know all the answers? No. <laughs> Are they fixed and, and sinless? No. Do they still have problems? Do they still have problems getting along with each other? Oh, yeah. But they say, I believe. Peter had declared earlier in John, John chapter 6, when so many left Jesus, even after miraculously feeding 13,000, 14,000 people, he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God, the one who was sent to save. How can I abandon you? I'm going to give up everything I have to follow after you. I don't have to know how or anything else. And guess what? You don't have to know how, because that's why Jesus said, I'm not going to orphan you. I'm going to send the Spirit back to you. And when He left this earth, the disciples said, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of heaven? And He said, It's not for you to know the answers to these questions. Why are you dwelling on them? But I will send my Spirit. You will receive power to proclaim the world of God, to be light, to be children of light united with one another for a common cause of telling the world about reconciliation to God, their Father, through Jesus Christ, their Lord. God sent His only Son to seek and save the lost. But there is a judge who will condemn based on the very words that are written in here. The Word that became flesh and dwelt among us as a light to stamp out the darkness. And the light will overcome the darkness. But many men and women will not come out of the darkness for fear or love of the darkness. 
Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Well, I don't serve the devil. I don't do that. But do you serve Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Because if you're not saving Him as Savior and Lord, Jesus is clear again. He said, whoever is not with me, whoever is not for me, is against me. There's no neutrality with Jesus. He is the dividing point of history. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He either is who He says He is, or He's a liar and not the Son of God. And He clearly says that He is God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Remember all the I am statements of John leading up to this and the I am statements that we're going to get into that Jesus continues to say. I am the vine. (laughs) You are the branches. There's not life without me. You won't have it. So he's crying out one last time to this world saying, will you believe? Don't forget how the chapter starts. It starts in John chapter 12 with a feast being thrown in the honor of Jesus. And Mary pours out a perfume that cost her a year's wage. But Judas, the truth came out. And even the disciples didn't understand because Judas said, why didn't we give this money to the poor? And some of the other disciples, if we read the other accounts, were like, you know, that might have been the smart thing to do. You don't have to know all the answers. You have to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And you have to cling to Him for eternal life. And then you're safe and secure, leaning on the everlasting arms. You have blessed assurance because Jesus is yours. Nothing can ever defeat you. Nothing can ever overcome you. Unless you put one of those butts in there, right? Unless you make that excuse. Whoever, anyone, everyone... As a result to the things they've already said, all the buts they've had in their life, whoever, anyone who will come to me and believe in me does not believe in me only, but believes in God Almighty. One that we cannot comprehend and we fail to think about His sovereignty. Because He wants to give us grace and love, we feel we're just fine and protected. It can go on and not have a God who is Lord and supreme of our life. Jesus Christ is God. He came to save us, but there is a judge. And everything that Jesus said was commanded of Him from God. And He was obedient even unto death of the cross so that He could save you. So that you could have a home in heaven. That you could have an eternal God who is your eternal Father. Wow. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way. Might, you might be an oddball, a foreigner in this land. Oh, I can think of all kinds of verses. It says we're foreigners and exiles, right? This is not our home. This is not where we're we're to build up treasures. But we're supposed to build them up where moths don't destroy and thieves don't come in and steal. An everlasting home. And Jesus said, I will return and bring my reward with you. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day because your light shines, illuminating others. They see the light and become children of light. And it stamps out the darkness. And then Jesus returns with His reward. Scripture's pretty clear. But wait a minute. Jesus left, so how can, our, how can the light still be here? <laughs> right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And you don't have to do it, but the Holy Spirit will do it for you. But you will receive power. The presence of God living in and through you. John 12, 36 said, Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. That means you can't stay in the darkness. You can't turn your light on dim. You can't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? We, we sing those songs to our kids, but then we kind of forget about them as we get adults. Deuteronomy tells us to train up our children, to write it on the doorpost of our house, to sit down and talk about it all day long when we gather together for meals, when we go out to talk about the love of Jesus Christ. They didn't know who Jesus Christ was, but we do, so 
we proclaim even more. They just had the hope. Hebrews tells about how they walked by faith. And they hadn't seen the hope of Jesus yet. They only had the promise of God. God fulfilled His promise in Jesus Christ, His one and only Son. That He loved you so much that He sent His one and only Son to die so that you might live. I believe. Then does your light shine. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. (laughs) He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He is inside of you, revealing His Word, revealing Himself, revealing the Father, because the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. That you can know the mysteries of God revealed in this salvation message, and you can have peace and joy, and you can tell others about the hope that's in you. So how near is Jesus as Lord of your life, dear Christian? Verse 47 of John 12 says, If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, which means puts them into practice, holds them dear. Oh, I can think of different parables and stuff where uh, the man found a precious treasure in a field, went out and sold everything he had so he could buy that field, right? Right? I can think of words of Jesus ringing out time and time again because we're to that point where Jesus has already taught all these words. These very words that will condemn you if you don't take those words to heart on that day. That day when either death comes or Jesus comes back. Whatever that day is, we can debate about that all day long. But what we can't debate about is there is a day and there is a judge. But... Right now, grace is being offered through Jesus Christ to save you. If anyone hears my words but does not keep him, I don't judge that person, for I did not come to the world to judge, but to save, to seek out, so that you will enter in through the gate of Jesus, because I am the gate. And the sheep hear my voice, not someone else's voice, and they obey my teachings, my voice. Safe and secure. Hooray! As long as I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. Not leaning on my own understanding, my own righteousness. My life sitting on the throne. As long as I'm not doing those things. How can you read John chapter 12 and not see the passion of a loving God? who for 4,000 years has tried to direct a people so that the world would see God through a people, a nation. And they continue to turn their back even with the mighty signs and miracles. Now we have the Messiah clearly coming to earth, John foretelling, John the Baptist foretelling of Jesus coming, saying, I must decrease so He can increase. This is the Son of God. And even John had doubts, but he still put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. How can we look at all the signs that John the Apostle writes about and not see that Jesus is God and deserves our worship as Lord, not just a Savior for us to live however we please? 2 Kings chapter 17 Starting in verse 13, reads this way. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all His prophets and seers, Turn from your evil ways. Observe My commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I have commanded your ancestors to obey and that I have delivered to you through My servants the prophets. But they would not listen and were stiff-necked, as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. If Jesus is God, are you trusting in Him as Lord? Verse 15, They rejected His decrees and the covenant He had made with their ancestors and the statues He had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. Any other... Thing in your life that has more importance than Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is a worthless idol leading you to worthless worship. Jesus has to be supreme in your life. Then you're safe and secure from all alarms. 
Back to John 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to, the, to judge the world but to save the world. We concentrate on that because of grace. And we forget verse 48. We concentrate on John 3, 16, but forget John 3 earlier where says, Jesus says, you must be born again. Verse 48, I'm going to read it again. There is a judge for the one who rejects who? Jesus. And the one who does not accept His words, His teachings. The very words that I have spoken will condemn them at that last day. Okay, I'll quiet it down a little. Is that better? Okay. Condemn them. There's no chance after condemnation. Right now, you have a chance to decide, will Jesus be Lord of your life or not? Verse 49, For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that His commands lead to eternal life. The whole purpose that John wrote this gospel, so that you may believe. Now we get to shift after that and see Jesus' personal relationship with those who believe and we get to see what Jesus does for us by laying down His life in the anguish that He has, by taking all of man's sins upon His shoulders and saying, Father, forgive them. So do you believe? Jesus came to the earth to save. God the Father will judge everyone. He is just and fair and offers mercy and grace to pardon you. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done. All you've got to do is accept Jesus Christ and His teachings. It's a free gift, but it's not cheap. Jesus Christ, God's Son, humbled Himself, gave up heaven, laid down His life in disgrace so that you could be lifted up in glory. This is our Savior and our Lord. His words are trustworthy. They bring salvation, safety, and security, and eternal life for those who believe in Him and believe His words. He teaches very clearly, and we've reached that judgment point of who you say that Jesus is. Grace is free, but it cost our Lord everything. And He says you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him if you truly believe. Do you remember from last week we talked about the blind man? John chapter 9. And his Pharisees... Didn't want to have any part of it. They're the religious leaders of the time that should know the answers. It should be showing the people the right way, but they're caught up in themselves and everything else. They live a lie. They're hypocrites. They put on a mask. And then you have the parents of the, of the child. Th their child. And they said, we'll throw him under the bus. We don't want any part of this because we fear men. You, you ask him. He's a grown man. We know that he was blind from birth, but we don't know about this Jesus fellow and how he got healed. And he was thrown out of the church. And Jesus came to him and said, Do you want to know who I am? Yeah, I do. And the man fell down and worshipped him. John 9, 14. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Oh, Jesus can't do that. That's wrong by our laws. This can't be the Son of God. He knows better than this. This, this is our teachings, men's teachings. We don't have to understand everything. We have all the signs of who Jesus is. But see, on that Sabbath day is what triggers so many people. In Luke 14, see if this sounds familiar. Verse 1, one Sabbath, <laughs> when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, here we go again, but this is from Luke. His words are so that you know what you believe, so you know how you behave, because you should have known what you believe already from John's words. He was being carefully watched there in front of him was a man suffering from ab abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He gets right to the question of your heart. Do you believe? Am I Savior? 
and my Savior and Lord. Because if you don't take up my words and my teachings and make me Lord, maybe you don't believe. Jesus is very clear. Nicodemus came to him at night, not in the daylight, so his deeds wouldn't be exposed, and he didn't get a word out of his mouth. And Jesus says, you must be born again. You see, the question really is, how can I be safe and secure for all eternity and have a half-hearted love for God and for His only Son? You can't. It's impossible. And it's a slap in God the Father's face that that's how you would worship His one and only Son. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remain silent. So taking hold of the man, he revealed, he healed him. He revealed the light to them. And he sent the man on his way. Sounds real familiar to the blind man, doesn't it? Who fell down at Jesus' feet and worshipped him because he had seen the light. He didn't fall down at Jesus' feet and say, Thank you, I'm going on my own way now. He worshipped him. We've reached the point in John chapter 12, do you believe? Wise men from the east have come, wise men from the west have come, seeking out this Jesus, the promised Christ, the Messiah of the world. Reading on in Luke 14 verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God, who will be there for eternal life. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At that time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Look at verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. You tell me this. If you make butts now in your life for not serving, Lord, what do you think you're going to do on that day? We already read how Israel became a stiff necked people and turn to idols. And we sit there and say, how could they do that? But how many times in our own life have we said, I'll make you Lord, but on my terms. I'll make you Lord when this is done. If it doesn't cost me this. <laughs> I myself said, I'll do anything but be pastor. And he says, he takes the foolish things of the world. <laughs> Hello again. But that's what he calls. And that's a matter of whether you're going to be obedient or not. Skipping down to verse 24 in Luke 14. I tell you, that means listen up. These are still words in reds. Not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. He's warning them again. You can't say you believe and not follow after me. When he first called his apostles, he said... Give up all you had and come after me. And uh, see, I picked fishermen so that you could be fishers of men because that's how much of a change I'm going to make in your life. And I'm going to take some stubborn, hard-headed people that will do it. Peter who <laughs> puts his foot in his mouth all, of his, all the time. John who wants to rain down fire from heaven. James who doesn't even get a chance. Because he's killed before he gets a chance to do anything. We're, I don't under, need to understand all these things. All I need to know is I was given power by God Himself living in me to proclaim the word of Jesus Christ. Verse 25 of Luke 14 says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And if you have an NIV, you see that above that it says, The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. To them he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, and those words are legitimate, hate, meaning I hate the things of this world, I despise them. Not I hate my mother or my father, but I hate everything in comparison to what Jesus is telling me. That he is Lord and ruler of my life. If anyone does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. I'm not on the throne anymore. You are God. Jesus is Lord. I will forsake all and go after you. You know what faith is an acronym for? Forsaking all, I trust Him. There's other acronyms too. 
But I trust Jesus. I forsake everything else and follow after Him because how could I not because of how much God loved me and gave Himself for me? If anyone does not hate even their own life, such a person might be okay on that day. No, that's not what it says, is it? Is it? It says they cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross, doesn't do this, this teaching of Jesus, which we've just read that came from God, that if anybody doesn't, there is a judge that will judge them and His very words will condemn them on that day. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. Let me go back to John 12 again and read that so you can hear this again in light of Luke 14. Starting in 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe Him. Verse 42, yet, oh, there's hope here. Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in Him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. So Jesus cries out and says, don't fool yourself. Verse 44, then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on that last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that His commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Pastor, I'm not staying in darkness. Don't you dare point your finger at me. I'll point them back at me then. Are you coming into the light then? They wanted to deny Jesus. You can't be the Messiah. You did these things on the Sabbath. We don't believe all these signs and everything. Jesus says, I am God. The very words spoken to you come from God. They're trustworthy. If you believe in me and my cause, you will have eternal life. If you make excuses... Maybe you're not safe and secure as you thought you were. Please, please, please come to me. If you're saved and you know it, your life will surely show it. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, what a blessedness, what a peace of mind. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Are you walking in the light of Jesus? Are you shining before men so that they may see your good works? Are you safe and secure in the arm of Jesus? What have I to dread? <laughs> what have I to fear? Because I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Jesus cries out, My commands, the Father's commands, lead to eternal life. You can trust. You can be safe and secure. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Dietrich Bonhoeffer penned these words about God's grace through His Son, His one and only Son, Jesus, the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the one who would save the people from their sins. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man his only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of His one and only Son. Debbie, do you think you picked out the right song for the closing? Come on up. <laughs> 